Hello everyone, my name is Tanchi Keta and welcome back to another video. In this video, I'm going to guide you through a complete project of implementing vector order regression on a time series model. So I've made several videos on time series forecasting and there were several requests for an implementation of a vector order regression model. And as usual, I've gone to great lengths to make sure that the code that I'm going to be providing is going to be the simplest possible. And I'm sure by the end of this video, you're not going to have any doubts left. And I'm going to guide you through the complete process of getting the data, how to pre-process it and what kind of steps you need to first take and then how to forecast uh, your time series into the future using a vector to regression model. So with that, let's get started. And uh, this is the code that I'm going to be using. If you want to understand the vector order regression in depth, the intuition, the mathematics behind it, I've already made a video on this. In this video, I'm going to be focusing on the implementation aspect. So we start by importing all the necessary libraries and uh, I'm going to get explain what libraries we need as we move along with the code. And over here, if you don't know what vector order regression is, I'm just going to give you a gist of it. This is how the equation looks like. And you basically use vector order regression where there are two or more time series which are interdependent on each other. So for example, normally in auto regression, what we do is we want to make predictions in the future. And we use the previous values, the previous time lags of a particular time series to make predictions into the future. In vector order regression, we assume that there are two time series which have a correlation. So when we are predicting a time series, let's say y1, we're going to be using the previous lag of y1, which is y1 t minus 1, as well as the previous time lag of some other time series y2. Similarly, you can look at the equation of y2 as well, which is dependent on both. Uh, the previous lag of y2 as well as the previous lag of y1. This is the fundamental concept and in more detail I've explained in my other theoretical video but in this I'm just going to focus on how to actually implement it. So to start with let's first start with the data set. I'm going to be providing this entire code as well. We start by importing a data set and I get a data set from this github link and this contains a lot of information of the economics of a particular country like, like the real gross national product, the potential gross national product and stuff like that. First step is of course to read the data set. We do that over here using the read underscore csa command. We provide the URL of the data and we mention past dates equals the date column. This makes sure that the pandas understands that the date column has date values and it does not treat it like a string. After that, we mention the index column as the date and over here I'm going to be printing the shape and I'm going to be printing the first five values so that you can have a look. And this is how my data set looks like. These are the time series. There are around three, four, five, six, seven, eight time series and there are 123 rows. All right. And you don't need to know what these represent. The basic concept is you have some time series and you want to make a forecast. And RGNP basically stands for real gross national product. PGNP stands for potential gross national product and ULC is unit labor cost. The rest of the information you can find in the URL of the data set as well. First step always is to plot a data set to get a feel of what the data actually looks like. And for that, I'm going to be using the matplotlib library. I'm creating some subplots. Basically, since I have multiple time series, I'm going to be creating four rows and two columns so that I can have four into two equals to eight, eight plots in one single go. And basically I'm going to be numerating through all the columns one by one, which you can see over here. And all the columns are going to be plotted with their respective names, which I'm setting over here. The rest is something just to make the plot uh, look better. So here is what the plots look like. And you can use vector order regression to forecast all of them together. But for the sake of simplicity, I'm going to be using only two time series. And just by visual inspection, it looked like RGNP and the ULC value might have some sort of correlation. It looks like they're increasing uh, in the same pattern. So for now, I'm only going to be using vector order regression for these two models, but you can extend the concept for uh, multiple time series as well. So before starting, of course, it's important to check if your data is stationary or not. Although when I'm training the model, I'm not going to be giving it stationary data, which I'll explain why I'm doing later. But in general, in all time series problem, this is what you should do. So we use the augmented Dickey Filo test and we have to provide which time series I'm going to be checking. I'm not going to go in depth of this uh, test, but I'm just going to explain you how to interpret this, right? So I'm going to be running this test on uh, macro data RGNP column. Similarly, I'm going to be running it on the ULC column and I'm going to be printing two values, which is the ADF statistic and the P value. And when I run this, 
this is what I get. And the only thing that you need to be bothered about is the p value. If the p value is less than 0 0.05, that means your data is stationary. If it's greater than that, then it's not. So I can see the p value is 0 0.98 and 0 0.99, which means my data is not stationary and you need to convert it to stationary. And what's going to work for you in most cases is just going to be simple differencing. And I've just commented over here and I'm going to remove this comment. So basically I'm going to be differencing the data set over here. And this is basically first order differencing. Each value is going to be subtracted by its previous value. And the same thing I'm going to be doing for ULC column as well. Okay. So when I print this, I can see that both the P values are less than 0 0.05, which means my data set is now stationary. If this doesn't work for you, you might have to do the differencing multiple times and then your data set can become stationary. This works in most scenarios. All right. So before proceeding further, when you're doing vector order regression, it is important to check that the two time series that you're working with or multiple time series, are they correlated? Do they have any sort of correlation? And that is the fundamental of vector order regression. And you can check that using the Granger causality test function, which you have uh, in the stats model library. And if I go to the original documentation, you can see, you just have to call the function and provide it the data set. And it tells you basically that whether the time series in the second column causes the time series in the first column. So for example, if I'm giving it two columns, ULC and RGNP, it will tell me does RGNP cause ULC and I can specify for how many lags do I want to check for now. I'm only checking for four lags. If it doesn't work for you, you can extend to multiple lags and see if that works. So similarly, I'm going to be doing it the other way around. Does ULC cause RGNP? And when I print the results, this is what I get again. Uh, there is a lot to understand about the tests, but if you simply want to interpret it, look at the P values, the P values should be zero point. The P values should be less than 0 0.05. So if it is, that means that this hypothesis is true. Basically RGNP time series causes ULC. And if I look at the other result, does ULC cause RGNP? I see that the P value is not less than 0 0.05 for the first lag at least. Similarly, I get a value less than 0 0.05, uh, somewhere around the second lag, somewhere around the third lag, as well as the fourth lag, right? So I have to take a lag greater than one. If I want to do forecasting for this, that's clear uh, right off the bat. Now, uh, before actually feeding the model into the time series and fitting it, we have to split the data set into training and testing. And here is where I'm going to do that. First, I'm only going to extract the two columns that I'm going to be working with, which is the ULC unit labor cost and the real gross national product. And the shape of the data is 123 rows. You can see that I have 123 observations in which I have to work with. So for now, I'm going to be splitting the data set uh, like this. I'm going to be taking the last 12 values in the testing part and the rest values in the training part. So if I run this code and I print the shape of the test data, you can see there are 12 rows. All right. So let's proceed with the fitting. We still have to ascertain how many number of lags do we want to consider. So for that, I'm going to be using the var class, which I imported from stats model. And what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to provide the difference data uh, and I'm not going to fit the model here because I'm not going to use this class to fit my model. I'm only using this because it provides an amazing function called a select order where you simply have to provide the maximum lags that you want to consider. In this case, I've given it 20 and it prints the summary and it will automatically uh, run the analysis and it gives you some characteristics like the AIC score, BIC score, FPE and HQIC score. You don't have to understand this. Just understand that for a good model, all of these parameters should be minimum as possible. Normally only looking at the AIC score is also enough. And what this uh, class does amazingly well is that it highlights where the minimum was found. So for AIC, FPE and HQIC, the minimum lag was found. The minimum value was found at lag number four. So that is what I'm going to be using uh, to build my model. I'm going to be using the past four lags, right? So in the equation that I'd shown you, it only considered uh, one lag before, right? Only Y1, T minus one and Y2, T minus one. What we're going to be using is we are going to be using four lags back as well. So it, it so in the equation, you will see T minus two, T minus three, T minus four as well. But you don't have to understand that if you want to build the model because the predefined classes handle everything for us. And to fit the model, I'm, I'm going to be using the var max class. 
and the reason i use this particular class is because it makes forecasting very easy so what i have to do i have to simply provide the training data note that i'm not providing it the difference data i'm providing it the non stationary data and i'm tell i'm going to tell you why i'm doing that i specify the order 4 comma 0 So notice this is a var max model which means we have to specify the order for the auto regression and the moving average part but we are building only a var model so the moving average part does not exist for now so the first order for the auto regression part is 4 since we are not going to be using the moving average part the other order also called as q is going to be 0 so this is a simple var model that we are going to be using and this var max class has something called as enforced stationarity and i specify that as true and when i went to the original documentation they mention if you keep it as true it will automatically transform the er parameters to ensure there is stationarity so that is why it did not provide the difference data to this and now i'm simply going to fit the model using var model dot fit and i'm going to print the summary and the summary is what is going to let you know about all the original equation and you can see what the minimum aic bic hqic scores was and this is the main part this is what tells you what the equation is right so you can see the equation for the time series ulc is going to be using all these parameters so you can see the lag l1 basically means lag 1 so ulc depends on the previous lag of ulc the previous lag of rg and p and from l1 you have all the values up till l4 and their respective coefficients right similarly you have the equation for rg and p as well all the four lags for ulc and rg and p and their corresponding coefficients so now you have got the equation as well for your time series model now if you want to make forecast it's really simple because of the var max library i simply call the function uh, i call the model first and i call the function get underscore prediction and i have to provide it from what date i want to start making prediction and the end date So the start date is the length of training data set. So wherever the training data set ends, from there I want to start making predictions. And for now, I have specified the number of forecasts as twelve, right? So it's gonna make for twelve steps in the future. And if you want to make future, if you want to make predictions way into the future, just simply change this number. If you change the thirty-six forty-eight, the number of predictions will increase. So here's where I specify the last forecast. So from the point the training data set ends plus n forecast minus one. all right so just running this line is going to get you the predictions and uh, when i write predict dot predicted underscore mean it's going to give me the mean of all the predictions and you can simply look at all the predictions over here i have renamed the column as ulc predicted and rgnp predicted and you can see we have the predictions up till the next 12 months till the end of my data set all right So if I want predictions way into the future I can simply vary this parameter let's say I put it to 24 and I run the same code all right and uh, I can see the predictions I get is up till 1992 right but for now I'm not going to do that but feel free uh, to use this I can also specify instead of the starting and ending point I can also specify the starting date and ending date as well I'm just going to comment it and leave it here and put this in the github repo and you can explore that over there so my predictions is done now is the part where i actually plot and see how my model did so i'm going to creating i'm going to be creating a new pandas data frame where i'm going to concatenate the original testing data set and the predictions all right and i'm going to store it in a new data frame called as test versus predictions and i plot it with a figure size of 12.5 so this is how my predictions look like the two lines at the top is basically rgnp and rgnp predicted and the bottom two lines is ulc and ulc underscore predicted and the model seems to be doing pretty well right and if you want to put a number to how good it is doing you can find out the mean squared error which is what i'm doing over here i'm finding the mean squared error i provided the predictions and the testing value and i simply print it over here i'm printing two things i'm printing the root mean squared error as well as the mean value general logic is if the mean value is let's say 100 then the root mean squared error should be way less than that right so when i printed i can see that the mean value was 178 and the root mean squared error was 54 this for ulc and for rgnp the mean value was 3900 and the error was 345 which is pretty good because it's less than 10% of the mean value right so that was all for this video if you did like it do like this video and subscribe to this channel 
and uh, see you on the next video